Showdown Volume 4. <laughs> We're here with Reese Winans. Hey, Alan, how you doing? I'm good, Reese. How are you? Glad to be here. Yeah, so you have uh, a special place in my heart, Reese, because you're one of just a couple of people who are in both One Way Out, the Inside History of the Allman Brothers, and Texas Flood, <laughs> the Inside <story. laughs> I think you and Dr. John, and well, Greg and Dickie are briefly quoted in Texas Floods, a little crossover. Alex Hodges is a character in both. But you have a central musical role in both these bands. So the last concert I was at before this whole thing began, and the last, the last thing a lot of people were at was March 10th, Madison Square Garden, The Brothers. You were on stage. <laughs> and... Uh, it really was a great night, you know. For, so from the perspective of the, you know, people are asking me all kinds of analytical questions. And I said, you know what? I didn't stop and think that much. I just sat back in my seat and sipped a beer and enjoyed it. It was a fantastic night of music. So before I ask specific questions, what was your experience on stage? Well, on stage was, was unbelievable. I had not played Madison Square Garden in, in, in quite a while. And, uh, and the fact that we played at 360 to where the whole entire building was sold out uh, was, was outrageous to me. Uh, and uh, that's number one. Number two, so I've been wanting to play with Warren Haynes. And, and number three, I've been wanting to play with Derek Trucks. And uh, so that was really great to, to we actually spend a couple of days with those guys, working the songs up and, uh, and getting ready for this thing, and it was just a terrific experience working with them. And then, and, and then to get to play the songs of the Almond Brothers, who are uh, who I think have some of the have have one of the best catalogs in rock. I love their songs. And um, then there's the thing, there's the whole thing about the bookends, you know, because I start, I sort of started out with uh, Dicky Betts and Barry Oakley back about 50 years ago. And uh, then, you know, uh, now I get to play those songs again in tribute to uh, Greg, an underrated B3 player, if you ask me. Uh, but uh, so, so it was really uh, a, a lot of things going through my mind that night. You know? Yeah. And, uh, and I, I wish we could have done three nights. Well, and, so, well, so, so a lot of people really would have enjoyed that, you know. <laughs> I have to say, you know, there were a lot of things made a lot of decisions that they made on the front end that people questioned and and every you know some people said they, the, the garden's too big they won't be able to sell it out uh they should have gas warren shouldn't do all the singing um you know you, there's a million different things that were questioned and and any decision that was made everyone was wrong and and the band was right <laughs> because it, it was just perfect I, I don't think that you would change a, a single thing about the way that whole night went down well, Warren is such a great singer, and uh, and I thought that he just nailed everything, and really uh, had quite a load on him to 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 do all that. And I just think, yeah, I thought he really came through like a champion, and uh, and so did everybody else in the band. And you know who else I I uh, was just thinking about is uh, Chuck Lavelle. I'm so glad that Chuck was there. It's, I'm, I'm I'm such a big fan of his. Yeah, and 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 it's a it's a cool thing in the Almond Brothers tradition of their whole history of 50 years it's not that many periods where you had two guitar players and keyboard uh, piano and organ um so it's a little it's a little different and of course he was playing the grand piano which is pretty pretty cool um was there any sense of real like was it nice for you to have at a gig where you just play b3 and don't have to worry about other other keyboard parts and just dig into one thing all night well, I have to tell you, Alan, usually I'm not crazy about working with another keyboard player. I really like to do the piano and the organ stuff myself. That way I, got, I know how to leave room for myself on, on the different keyboards. I know when I want to bring this in, when I want to bring that in. Uh, and, uh, and so I'm used to doing all of that myself. Um, uh, having Chuck over there is a guy that I... Uh, respect immensely and then I trust implicitly musically uh, 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 I knew that everything was going to be just right and you know the older I get the more I the more I enjoy listening to people other, other people play and and uh, and I, I like giving them their space and and uh, and so yeah we you got to think about it we have two two guitar players 
two keyboard players, three drummers, and only one bass player. I think O'Teal is the guy who got left out, man. He needed another bass player up there. That's all there is to it. Well, <laughs> it did occur to me at some points that, that, that I, I, again, I've never questioned the wisdom of Dwayne Allman, but it sounded so good with the two keyboards and you were playing so well. I, I did think at one point, maybe Dwayne was wrong. He should have kept two keyboard players the whole time, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, well, could have worked. Uh, worked. Who knows, man? You know, uh, I have to tell you, Alan, uh, reading your book about about the early early days of the Almond Brothers and what those guys went through up there in Macon, about how they were just struggling to get by and how, how difficult it was for them, it would have been tough for me to stick that out. I don't know if I could have if I could have done it if done what they did. And um, and you know things work out the way they're supposed to sometimes. So let's talk a little bit about Second Coming, which is how you ended up in that in that organization. So you were playing with with uh, Barry and and Dickie in Second Coming in Jacksonville, Florida, in 1968. Um, well, it's a it's a. I'll tell you the story about how I because uh, I knew uh, Dickie Betts from Sarasota, where I first started playing is in Sarasota. And that's where I and that's where I also met Barry Oakley, who came down from Chicago. He was working with the Romans, and uh, he got a gig with with our band, which was called the Bittersweet. And we were backing up a, a great soul singer named uh, Bobby Day, I think his name was. And uh, uh, and that's where that's where I met uh, Barry Oakley. He's our bass player. So I I knew Barry, I knew Dickie, and I, and Rhino. The, the other guitar player in the second coming was our guitar player in the bittersweet. So, so I knew all those guys. They had, uh, uh, the three of them, Dickie, Barry, and Rhino had met up with this guy, Leonard Rensler, who wanted to put a band together and uh, who owned a nightclub in Jacksonville. I was not ready to make a big move all the way from Sarasota to Jacksonville. That was a little too much for me at the time. So they went on and did that, and Dickie got his wife, Dale, to play, to play B3, and she also did a lot of the singing. Um, um, they uh, went on, and as things, things go, uh, Dale was uh, expecting a baby. And, uh, and, uh, and so they had to, they had to figure out, they did, they, the, the gig in Jacksonville was a six-night-a-week gig. They didn't want to take a break from that. And they wanted to keep going. They, everybody wanted to was enjoy making the money, and so they called me up. So would I come up and and, and play for uh, until she had the baby, and uh, and uh, and you know could get back to get back to things. Well, so I did, and she had the baby, a beautiful baby, and uh, and um, w they really liked what I what the way I played organ. They all came back. She was just the lead singer. And I stayed up there playing organ because it was such a great band. Dicky and Rhino playing the, the dual guitars were unbelievable. Um, uh, uh, Rhino did a bunch of the Hendrix stuff. Uh, Dicky sang I Got a Mind to Give Up Living and a, a bunch of Paul Butterfield blues kind of stuff and some Clapton stuff. Um, I mean, the, the, our drummer with that band was John Meeks. Uh, who was a, a, a really soulful drummer. And uh, John sang, Dickie sang, Barry sang, Rhino sang, Dale sang, everybody sang except me. And uh, 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 we played at this nightclub. Uh, it, it, you don't really see nightclubs this or, like this around too often, or at least I had never seen them. With, uh, it was a psychedelic nightclub. And I'm talking about 50 years ago. There wasn't anything like this down in Florida. And liquid projection screens on the walls with strobe lights hanging over the flashing light, lit up dance floor, uh, uh, walled in cocktail lounge in the back where you could sit if you didn't want to, if, if the music was too loud for you, you could go in the, the, the glass walled in place and watch the, all the kids dance to us, you know. And uh, uh, so we would play there six nights a week. And then uh, Sunday night, uh, we started this jamming in the park sort of thing you know because we just that's all we we did is we played music we loved it right was that barry's idea because i know with the allman brothers it was barry's idea to start playing for free in piedmont park in atlanta so it was 
was the Jacksonville? Uh, he had he had a lot to do with it. I think I think. See, we we started playing at Willow Branch Park in Jacksonville on Sundays. We didn't get any permits or anything. We just went down there and set up and did it, and uh, and it was okay, you know, and it, it worked out fine. And uh, and and we immediately attracted a crowd of people who who uh, loved free music and uh, and wanted to be around a happening thing. Uh, uh, and uh, the city, in their wisdom, allowed us to do it, you know. And, uh, so I have a few questions about this. So one, was there any element uh, at that point, especially when you were playing for free in the park, was there any harassment of like the long haired, you know, c kind of thing? There was that sort of thing going on everywhere at that time, uh, but not not on the Sundays in the park. That was that was kind of a beautiful thing. And uh, I think the people who would harass the hippies just uh, didn't come, come down to that because they knew it would be that's who would be there you know hippies uh sort of uh hitchhiking kind of homeless kind of you know every every everybody who was just hanging out in a in the park would come out you know and it was and we would have hundreds thousands of people later on you know just about big crowds of people and we started bringing in the other local bands to where they wanted to play too you know and so it really became a thing we started out at the Willow Branch Park and we eventually moved to a place called the, the Forest Inn. <coughs> and it became even more of a big deal there. And I, I think of those things at the park that Gary and, and, and Alan and Ronnie, who went on to be Leonard Skinner, were coming down there and standing in front of you guys and being inspired. Uh, the, the, they were there, they were, no, they were, they were called the 1% at that point. Uh, um, um, Butch Trucks, Scott Boyer, and David Brown, with their band, the, uh, uh, I think they were called the uh, 31st of February. Right, yeah. 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 yeah, I think, I think they, I think they, 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 they started coming down. Um, uh, Black, uh, Black Bear, somebody, there was all, all the local bands in town that, that played rock music, wanted to come down. They all wanted to jam with us, you know, and we wanted to jam with them. It was, it was just, a musical community kind of getting together. And you know, we'd, we'd pass out the things that we had to them and they'd pass out what they had to us. And everybody really had a big old time, you know. Uh, uh, I don't recall there being any trouble of any kind at all, you know. It's a pretty peaceful yeah. undertaking, just, just a lot of people enjoying the music. So how was Dale keyboard playing? Was she a, was she a, a real player that could hang with with everyone else in that band, or was she more? She was down very down. much of a supportive kind of keyboard keyboardist, but a very good singer. And uh, and I really liked her and Dickie singing together. You know, they did a, a couple of songs by the Rascals. She did a bunch of Jefferson Airplane stuff, uh, uh, which Barry Oakley really liked. He was a fan of Jack Cassidy. And so uh, he, really, he kept wanting to bring more and more of the, of the West Coast of California psychedelia into our band. And we were fine with that because we, we liked everything. And I've heard that the band was named the Second Coming because of Barry looking like Jesus. Is that, is that true to your memory? <laughs> well, I don't, I've never heard that story. So, you know, they named it that before I got there. And so I don't really know the, the, what, they, what went on to. Did Barry, already, did Barry already have that look with the long hair? He always had that look. Yeah. I, I have to tell you something uh, about Barry Oakley. He's one of the, the greatest bass players, one of the best guys I've ever met. Just a completely uh, wonderful human being. Uh, and he was really the backbone of the second coming. He, we would we would stretch out and, and, and go into these jam sections, which was kind of unheard of back then. Most most bands in those days in Florida were playing three minute songs, five minute songs, you know, and, and there was no, there was no this uh, uh, let's see where we could take it kind of thing. Right. This, this experimental thing. Barry brought that in. So. Um... So Barry brought that in. Now he was already with Linda, I think. So uh, yeah, was he a big presence of, of someone you were hanging out with because you know getting to know Linda was one of my favorite parts of writing One Way Out. I have to say she's just just a wonderful person and a wonderful presence and uh, very smart, insightful, and fun to talk to. 
Uh, I'm wondering if she was, I assume she was always like that from the time you met her, but I'm wondering. Yeah, she was, she, she, she was always terrific. And uh, uh, I, re I really liked her very much. And, uh, and we all lived together in a, in a big house. I mean, uh, uh, they had, their room was right next to uh, my, my wife's room, you know, and uh, um, Dickie and Dale lived uh, across, the, across the hallway. <coughs> uh, uh, I mean, we all lived there, you know, uh, Rhino and Pam lived there. And, and he, Rhino was sort of the wildest one of, of the group. He went on to play with uh, Captain Beyond, and uh, Iron Butterfly, right? The Iron Butterfly yeah. with uh, Mike Panero and uh, Mike Panero and uh, and um, uh, and he was Rhino was was just a, a sort of an outlaw kind of character would just do anything. Well, I loved him. He was he was <laughs> just, he was so raucous. Speaking of outlaw type of character, what about what about Dickie in those days? Dickie in those days was was. Not, I mean, you hear a lot of things about uh, Dickie Betts uh, over the years about about how sort of rock and roll, how wild, how uh, how how you know uh, different, yeah, you know, different stories about him. I don't recall that much of that going on in those days at all. You know, he was uh, he was just playing unbelievable guitar. He was the best guitar player I had ever heard, and. Uh, and uh, singing great and playing great, and uh, it seemed like uh, uh, he was just in his element. He, he seemed to really be enjoying it. Yeah, you got to remember, Alan. This was 50 years ago, so so maybe time has has diminished my my recollection of the wildest. But I don't think so. I, I, I think he was he was just pretty uh, pretty on 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 the ball. So then Dwayne shows up. Uh, initially, he's just coming by to jam, right? He's sitting in with the band. Um, so when he would come sit in, did all three of them play guitar, or did Rhino walk off the stage ever, or at, at what point did it become clear that Dwayne and Dickie had a thing going, and did that create any tension, because Rhino obviously was a big presence and a great guitar player in his own right, so was what, what was that whole dynamic like? Well, I remember distinctly the first time I ever uh, met Dwayne Allman, and uh, the first time I ever heard him play. He just, <clears throat> excuse me, he just walked on stage, as far as I know. I didn't know him. I don't know if Barry knew him or not, or if Dickie knew him. I'm not sure. I think I, he just walked on stage and started playing slide guitar, which I had never heard anyone play slide guitar. And then, and, and then you have to realize it's Dwayne Allman playing slide guitar, who's probably the preeminent slide player in rock rock and roll history i mean he was who was better than him uh, i don't know anybody uh who, who who did anything like that uh uh so it, it was just this outrageous instrument that we heard in our music and my recollection is that all three of them played at the same time and they all had different different spaces that they played um rhino being the rock guy the hendrix guy probably would bow out, let them play, let Dickie and Wayne play more of the blues. You know, that's probably the way it worked out. And probably how it worked out like that. Uh, with uh, later on, as we were as we're jamming at the Forest Inn with all the other uh, musicians in town, you know, uh, Dwayne and Dickie started doing the harmonized guitar riffs. You know. Which we did. We did some of that in the Second Coming. It was mostly me harmonizing with Dickie. But uh, with when Dwayne showed up, it was Dickie and Dwayne doing the harmonizing, and and they really liked that. You know, the, the the double guitars really worked great. And when you're doing that, there's plenty of room for a rhythm guitar player. So, uh, so I, my recollection is, for the most part, they played together. My understanding of how that worked has always been that. Uh... For the most part, Dickie came up with the riffs and Dwayne harmonized because Dickie has such an incredible melodic uh, sense, which you can hear in everything he's ever done. And Dwayne had more or less, of what I understand, perfect pitch, so he could had the fantastic it. ear. Yeah, he could yeah, just he hear could it. Just hear, hear something and jump on it. Uh, is that so? That that lines up with your memory or understanding of how that worked. Uh, well, I don't know if he had perfect pitch or not, but he would just have a sense of what the what to play on these lines. You know, whether he would play perfect thirds or, or just uh, a set, uh, uh, other 
other intervals that 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 would match up and somehow make the make the whole thing work. He knew how to make it work. And how how would you rate your own playing at that time? Like compared to what it was like, I don't you know, ten years later, did you know what you were doing? Like like no, no, I was I was <laughs> I was a kid. I didn't I didn't I, I, my favorite uh, uh, keyboard player was probably uh, Ray Mantharek or uh, uh, the guy who played with the Vanilla Fudge or uh, uh, you know people like that. You know I, I was I was really uh, had come to music later in life than a lot of these guys. I didn't start playing in a rock band until I was <coughs> 17, 18 years old. Okay. And a lot of those other guys have been playing since they were a lot younger than that. So once they take the next step from those jams and they're going, I guess, mostly at Butch's house and at the greenhouse and they're, they're having these jams. And I believe you were in the room during the, the thing that Butch loved to talk about where Dwayne, you know, stops and says, this is it. You know, this is my band. You can't leave this room. You want to leave this room. You got to fight through me. <laughs> you remember that the way Butch lo loved to tell that story? Well, I remember Butch telling the story, and I, re I remember hearing this, hearing about that story. I have to tell you that uh, uh, my recollection is of a of a private conversation, that, <coughs> excuse me, that I had with Dwayne after sometime after that, where he said, "You know, uh, um, I can't have two guitars, two drums, and two keyboards," and uh, and uh, I don't, you know, I, 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 you know, I don't know what. To, I, I hate to say this, but I think we're just going to go with Greg on the organ, and uh, and 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 that's that's gonna that's the way this band is going to be. And I was I was pretty disappointed because I loved them, you know. And so at that point, I was, you know, uh, me and Rhino, John, John Meeks, you know, the other the other people who were not in the Allman Brothers band were sort of left out you know and uh and uh, so we had to figure out what we were going to do and and uh not long after that um you know the almond brothers got together and worked up their worked up their sauce they would uh, we, at that time we were playing shows at uh at the armory i think and uh, they believe the almond brothers opened up a show or two we, and we had put a band together as the new second coming and um, uh, they had opened like, like i said play we, we actually had a co-bill for a couple of nights right. and they moved on they went up to macon to to, to uh make their record and, and work uh, work up there just just to step back for one second so when they started having these more formalized jams so then jmo shows up with with uh, Dwayne, which i guess was already there he lived in jacksonville um do you remember the first time or, or, or just here, you know, playing with Butch and JMO and, um, you know, they became such a, such a force as a unit of drummers. And I'm they were not a, they were not a force back then when they started, they, be, they became that. Yeah. So that, that they had to feel that out. In there. It was, it, it was, uh, it was, uh, I mean, there was it, the idea of two drummers is really a cool idea because you sometimes a, a one drummer would, would try all sorts of things and the other drummer will just you know they will make you lock it in a little bit more and those two guys were really locked in back in back in those days yeah. and uh and jama would do the jazz sort of fills and uh, butch would do all the the rock fills and it worked it, it worked out great so I do not have a, 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 a clear recollection of the first time right. I saw them play, no. But I did see Butch play with a lot of drummers at those jam sessions. Right. Um, and Butch had such a distinct sound that was just so, I mean, it was so there for the Allman Brothers. I mean, it, it, you know, it, it, nothing. And that's a, just, just to go back to the Brothers show. I mean, I thought Dwayne Trucks did a wonderful job. Um, because it's, you know, of course there's a lot of great drummers and a lot of people I'm sure would be fine, but that's it, it, not, you know, there's something very distinct about the way Butch played. Um, and, and Dwayne just, I thought, was, was great. 
I thought Dwayne was, was one of my favorite guys in the band. I thought he really captured it. Did a, a, a superb job on drums. Just played beautiful all night. Um, so once the Allman Brothers then become the Allman Brothers and they move to Macon and things start to happen, did you did you watch, pay attention to their career closely? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And I'll tell you, uh, uh, one of the things that happened, <coughs> you know, um, you, you mentioned it. They started playing those free shows in the park in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And that re that's what really get, uh, garnered them their early attention, I believe. And, uh, and uh, so that was modeled after things that we did in Jacksonville with the Second Coming. The first song on the Alman Brothers' first record starts out with, I don't want you no more. That was the song, I don't want you no more, was the song that the second coming played to begin the show every single time that we played. Wow. And so that, doom, da, 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 right. that, was, that was our theme. Wow. Did you, so play it in, that, in, did you play it more like the Spencer Davis original, which is a lot like, yes. Uncier, yeah. Or did you yeah, play we, it more we, like we sang, we sang it, we played the riff, but then he sang it. Right. It never went to the sort of Latin organ solo with the uh, tritonish uh, 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 figures, uh, uh, but but I really appreciated them paying tribute to our band. I thought that was uh, that was really terrific. And yeah, I followed them very closely. I, I, I was like I said, friends with uh, uh, with Dwayne and Dickie and Barry and uh, and Butch. I knew him. Uh, I didn't know Jamo very well, and I didn't know Greg very well, uh, but. Uh, but I wanted to see them do well. Um, uh, Dwayne actually got ended up getting me a job. Um, with who? With uh, Boss Keggs, uh, one of the one of the people that that Dwayne had recorded with in Muscle Shoals. Yeah. yeah, was Boss Keggs, uh, and uh, he did the "Loan Me a Dime" uh, record, and uh, and Boss was putting a band together, and so Dwayne recommended me. And uh, and I, I really appreciated that. So I actually relocated to San Francisco to work with Boz. That's awesome. How long did you play with Boz in that run? About a year and a half. And uh, we we just did local clubs in San Francisco. Uh, we played the Fillmore several times. Uh, we did go to uh, go on the road. We went to Hawaii once. We went to uh, Vegas or Reno or somewhere once. But mostly it was just around San Francisco and Marin County. <coughs> was that the beginning in a way of your career as like a, an ace sideman and accompanist to the, to the stars? <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose, you, I, I suppose you could say that. I mean, uh, uh, I, you know, I would have stayed out there. The only reason I left was my wife at the time uh, was unhappy in San Francisco. She didn't like it there. So she left. She left me out there, and uh, and I I wanted to rekindle our marriage, you know. So I, uh, you know, uh, reluctantly said goodbye to a uh, boss and them, and and came back to Florida to try to uh, salvage uh, that relationship. Mm -hmm. um, there was a show in Tampa, and I I should know the date offhand, but I don't. Where Greg was sick or whatever, and didn't didn't perform. One, and and, and there, it's it's a famous show. It gets traded around a little bit, although there's not a great recording of it. And Dwayne sang, and Dicky did some singing. And you you played keyboards, I believe, right? I played organ on it. I, it uh, I I heard that not too long ago. There's also a piano on that, and I don't think I'm playing the piano. I think there was somebody else playing piano. So I think there was two keyboards there that night. Okay. I have I I have a very dim recollection of that night, uh, uh, but it was a real uh, treat to be involved with them again. It's 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 an interesting and weird thing to me that Dickie was such a great singer at Second Coming, and ultimately such a great singer in the Almond Brothers, but he didn't sing for the first few years. You know, he didn't have a vocal on an Almond Brothers record until Blue Sky, um, Anita Peach, which is. And then if you listen to him sing, it certainly doesn't sound like a beginner singer, so to speak. I mean, he was not a beginner singer. He was a great accomplished polished singer um it's it's interesting that he didn't uh i i guess 
that, that that was just said that Greg was the singer at the beginning of that band. That's how it was viewed, I suppose. I wonder. I I I, I I'm. That's a good. You'll have to ask Dicky. I I really don't know. You know uh, what? If if he had some reluctance to singing, if uh, if they just wanted to work up uh, Greg's songs, it's possible mm -hmm. that they thought Dicky's songs were too country. Um, well, but when he well, even when uh, Dicky did write his like like revival, you know, it was on Idle Wild South, but Greg sang it. Um, but you were talking about how Dicky was such a great guitar player in Second Coming. Was he similar to the Dicky Vets that we all got to know in the Allman Brothers? Uh, was his playing very different, or was it pretty similar to to what came, what who we all know of as Dicky Vets? On the early Allman Brothers records. And, uh, and the first, their first record and the live at the Fillmore record. I would listen to those, to those songs and try to figure out who, which one is Dickie and which one is Dwayne. And uh, Dickie was always the <coughs> more imaginative, the one who would, who, would, who would stretch the edges a little bit uh, of the music lead. And, uh, and I don't recall Dickie being that guy. Um, with the second coming. It, uh, uh, we had a couple of songs that we, that we would play the sort of what you would call the long versions of. And uh, when we did that, you would see that was the beginning of Dickie's uh, uh, experimental, experimental side where he would uh, create melodies and, and, and go to magical places with them. Uh, so yes, uh, uh, we saw a little bit of that Dicky Betts with uh, with the uh, Second Coming, but what what you really saw in the Second Coming was what a great blues guitarist Dicky was, and you see that on on songs like uh, Stormy Monday course, and things yeah. like that with the Allman Brothers. And that is one of you know Dicky is such a unique guy because he is such a great blues player, and then he is so imaginative, and then he's also writing blues guy, and he's also writing in memory of Elizabeth Reed. It's all coming out of the same brain pretty different approaches to music all of them i think you know beautifully executed and very original um, i it, i'm i'm hard pressed to think of of a, a better two guitar band than those two guys Dwayne and dicky when they were when they you know those, those they, they only had a couple of years together well you're hard you know, pressed uh, because there isn't one <laughs> you can't really come up with one because it doesn't exist yeah, I mean, uh, they were, that, that was my favorite two guitar band. So years later, you end up with Stevie, you know, through, through originally coming in to do the sessions. And we've talked about it a lot, but I'll, I'll throw that out there for anyone who doesn't know. And if you want to know more details, you got to read Texas Flood. But um, so you start, you start playing with Stevie. How would you compare him as, as a band leader and a personality to, to Dickie or Dwayne? Because, um, you know, you are in a very unique thing. So we talk about, people always ask me who's, who are your favorite guitarists, but I don't, I don't like to make best guitarist list because it's so subjective. But for me, three of the top four or five, for sure, are Dickie, Dwayne, and Stevie, my own favorites. And of course, you played with all of them a lot. So how, how, I've, been, I've, I've been lucky with guitar players. Um, here's, here's what I would say, Dwayne Almond was a great band leader. I mean, you, 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 you would just go to war with that guy. You would do anything for him. It was just that guy, you loved him. He would do anything for you, you'd do anything for him. He was just that kind of guy, he'd capture your enthusiasm. You know, Dickie was more of a, of a, of a, well, he's sort of more doing his thing and, 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 and just musical greatness, you know, musically fantastic, you know. Uh, uh, I never thought of him as a, I worked, I actually did a couple of shows with him with Great Southern um, uh, back in the day and, and worked with him, you know, uh, 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 with, with, uh, on the road with that band and, and met him earlier in Sarasota with other bands. He's a great guy, not, not a fantastic band leader, which everybody is not. I'm not a good band leader. Vicky Betts was a, was a, a, a good, a, 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 an okay band leader. But but Dwayne Allman just used to that guy you just would do anything for him, and you know who else was like that is Steve Ray Vaughan was the kind of guy 
because he's laying it out there every night. He's giving you everything he's got every night. And so you just, you, you just can't, you, you can do everything you can to support him and uh, to, to make it right for him. And so uh, um, hard to compare guitar players, you know, especially Dwayne Altman, who just who played beautiful slide. None of those other guys played slide like that. You know, uh, um, Vicky played the classic blues, a very ex uh, uh, experimental, uh, beautiful melodic lines. On uh, on this on the, on the long solos, Stevie just had the great vocabulary of blues chops and with, knew how to build a solo that would just build and build and build and soaring up into the atmosphere. Uh, so it's th three different kind of guys. Um, you joined Double Trouble, obviously, well into their career. They all been in a band together, growing up to the bus and the success and everything else, um, and playing so many gigs before you set foot. So was that a different sort of challenge to come into a band? And did Stevie ever tell you what to play and what not to play, or, or did they just toss you out there and you had to figure it out? Not only did he tell, not tell me what to play, when I first started playing with him, I thought I was just gonna play the songs from Soul to Soul that we had just recorded when I was new in the band. But he wanted me to play the whole night. You know, uh, all the songs, some of the songs I had never even heard before. Uh, uh, so. No, he just threw me out there. Just whatever you do, it's going to be great. And uh, um, he was, uh, and Tommy and Chris, um, bass player and drummer with that band, were so happy to have another instrument on stage, so they could. When Stevie went to do his soloing, there was some a uh, a uh, uh, a chordal instrument that they could all mesh around. You know, something to to where we could make allow the rhythm session to uh, uh, be focused on. Uh, as we follow Stevie Solo. So, uh, uh, yeah, those guys, those guys were fantastic. And they were very welcoming to me in the band. And, and Stevie, you know, was very influenced by the original Allman Brothers and by Dwayne. Um, so I'm just wondering, did you ever talk about that with him? Did he know about your history with them? Uh, he, he knew about it. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't talk about the Allman Brothers very much. You know, I was surprised to find uh, and it might have been in your, in your book that uh, the Allman Brothers were big fans of Stevie, and I, I, I was not aware of that. Uh, uh, I think I think we all just were fans of each other, you know. We were fans of good music, you know. Uh, 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 the Allman Brothers have a, had a southern thing going on that a lot of the Texas blues guys didn't really care for, you know. They wanted they wanted it to be blues. They wanted it to be raw and guttural and, and, and mean. And that's not really what the, the Allman Brothers were about. They were about finding, finding the beauty in those songs. You know, uh, so it's really two different, two different sorts of blues. So you, I was we were talking before about your debut solo CD after all these years album, uh, Sweet Release. It's a great album. Uh, Joe Bonamassa, your, your current band leader, um, employer, I guess, um, produced it, right? Right. Um, and you talked about wanting to play with Warren. Warren has some few really nice songs on here. Um, did that come about through your relationship with him or Joe? Like, how did Warren end up on, on that? Joe and Warren played at the uh, Hall of Fame together where they, I think they inducted uh, Freddie King into the Hall of Fame. And so Joe and Warren knew each other. This uh, getting Warren to play on my record was a complete Joe Bonamassa thing. You know, I had nothing to do with it. Although I was really happy that that he was there. You know, uh, I never I never saw Warren during the making of the record. We we sent him the track, we played and sang, fantastic stuff. Sent him, you know, and uh, and uh, so one of those guys that I never met. Until we we did the Allman Brothers, the Brothers thing. Yeah, that's so. The first time you met him was at the rehearsal for the Brothers show. Yep, amazing. Uh, actually, no, no. Actually, we we had played. Uh, Joe Bonamassa had played Warren's <coughs> Christmas show, right? Uh, two years ago, and uh, and that's where I met him the first time. Okay. Well, I'm proud to say that I I reintroduced Joe and Warren uh, in 2009 or 10. Um, I was on the road with Joe for a few days for a story for Guitar World, and we were in Chicago, and Government Mule was playing the same night. Government Mule, I think, was at the Riviera or the Aragon, and 
Joe was a bit smaller act at the time was playing. Uh, I, I forget the names of the clubs, but anyhow, um, I mentioned it to Warren that I was going to be there. And he said, Oh, Joe and I were old friends. Maybe see if you can bring him over. It'd be cool if he sits in if the timing works. So we, anyhow, we started a whole thing. And after Joe sound check, we jumped in a van and ran up to the Riviera and uh, they rehearsed um, Sco Mule and feel like breaking up somebody's home. Then we ran back to the Joe show. And after his show, the promoter had a van waiting and we zipped up. So uh, I, I was really proud to make that. They, they had known each other from years before. In fact, um, Joe recorded a, a Warren song on maybe, I don't know if it was on one of his early solo albums or on uh, Bloodline. But um, anyhow, it was really, really fun. And I'm glad they've done a, a lot more stuff together, including that. Uh, oh, yeah, I think I think those two guys work together great. And uh and uh, Joe Bonamassa is another guy we need to talk about. I mean, is a fantastic guitar player, and uh, and uh, and and I don't know what it is about guitar players. I just seem to uh, they just seem to be drawn to him. And Joe's technique is uh, uh, and dazzling playing completely different than any of the guys we've been talking about. You know, different than Warren, different than than Derek, different than Wayne, Dickie, or Stevie. You know, it's just an, another fantastic guitarist and uh um joe of course has got himself a, a, a fantastic career uh which um, um yeah he should be proud of and uh, i think he is well and and aside from the brother show we were just hanging out a couple months ago on on joe's keeping the blues alive cruise which it, it's hard to believe a couple of months ago we were on a cruise ship right uh, given everything that <laughs> no kidding happened since but um I'm glad I I'm glad I did that, uh, and I got to see so much great music, including uh, s several of Joe's performances. And you you were like all over the place. You were sitting in with uh, so many guys, so many bands, um, and and it was great. You were like the the secret ingredient to pop up, and then you did your own show. Um, and and so as long as we're talking about, it, we should throw out a, a shout out to Josh Smith, who played Stevie Parts with you when you on, on your solo show. Great uh, young guitar player. I thought he he was. He was awesome. You know, I love doing that. Uh, 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 when we, when I tour with Joe now, I've been touring with Joe for about five years. We hardly have, we, we never have a support act. We hardly ever play festivals. It's usually just us. And so when there's a chance, you know, when there's a whole bunch of bands playing in the same place, I love to go sit around and sit in with the other bands. And uh, Josh Smith is one of those, uh, uh, up and coming guitar players. He's just uh, plays beautiful and uh, uh, helped Joe produce my record. It was uh, I really appreciated uh, him being there. I told him, yeah, I would, I, I've been wanting to sit in with him, and, and he's been wait, wait, wanting to play my set. So you know, we just uh, we we had to get together. He had a great band as well, and and uh, Joe's band is is really great. Also, I mean. Uh, and, and so you said you're attracted to guitar players, but maybe guitar players are also attracted to you because, um, you know, if someone like Joe needs a keyboard player, he knows that you know how to support a great guitar player and, you know, what, what to do when. Um, but that whole band is, is really wonderful, you know, with Anton and, and Michael, the rhythm section, of, the singers are great, also super nice. I spent some time hanging out with those ladies, who are wonderful people. Um, Aren't they just the best, man? Uh, Jade and uh, and Juanita and the one you didn't meet, Mahalia. They're all fantastic. I love them. If they're, if you're watching uh, Jade and Juanita, it was really fun hanging out with you guys. I hope you're doing well. I assume they're down in Australia now. They are in Australia, and Jade has a new record coming out. And uh, listen to Jade McRae on uh, YouTube. Okay, great. Are you on? Or did you play on that? Is that another Joe? Nope. nope. Okay. No, Joe played on a song, but I'm not on that. Okay. Um, well, Reese, this has been a lot of fun catching up with you. And I, and, and I said this right the next day, you know, I reviewed the show for Billboard, the brother show. If you recall, I only used one quote in it, which was from you, which was, it was magical. And I said in that review, and I certainly stand by it now, it's been almost two months or um, if this is the last show we have for a while, I, I can live with it. And I, and I am glad that, that I think we're real lucky. We dodged a bit of a cannonball there um with illness uh there's no there's no question about it uh, uh um you know uh i left i left uh new york after playing that show to rejoin joe 
And we never played a show because all the venues that we were scheduled to play had shut down. So that was really the last night before mass gatherings shut down everywhere. And you know, I don't know if it's in the cards or not, but wouldn't it be fantastic after, after playing the last show before the pandemic at the Madison Square Garden, when that place opens up again, I'd love, I wish we could go in there and, and be the first guys back. Oh, I like that idea, Reese. You know, everybody watching this video right now just threw up their arms in the air because if they're watching this, they 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 love that idea. I'm sure that um, that's it's a wonderful thought, and and uh, you know, lucky that we have that memory to to hold on to out during these long months. No no shows performing or going to for us is is a hard. It's hard, and you you know, you've been talking. We're talking about go, your history going back over 50 years. Have you ever taken this long off, off of playing music in, in all those 50 plus years? No, no, I've never, I've, I've, I've never seen anything like this in my life. Uh, and uh, and uh, the picture is pretty bleak for musicians right now, you know? I mean, I'm sure that we're gonna get through it and there'll be something on the, uh, uh, at, at that point on the other side. And, uh, and we'll all look forward to that and try to be optimistic about it, but right now it's just, it's looking a little bleak, and uh, so we'll we'll see we'll see how things turn out. Yeah, well, stay healthy, be well, and uh, this this was uh, a lot of fun, Reese. I, I I learned a few things I didn't know, so I hope people enjoy it, and uh, it's great to talk to you. Thanks, Alan. Good talking to you. Thanks, Reese. Bye. See ya.